The jungles of Lustria were charred and bloodied, totally ravaged by the caustic green warp fire. After the Skaven's hard-won destruction of the Lizardmen's temples and strongholds, the Slan departed for the stars. Hope for the southern continent was lost, while in the north, the Witch King Malekith made a daring decision to abandon his mother and his kingdom to invade Ulthuan and claim the throne of the Phoenix King. Even during the end times, the timeless conflict between High Elves and Dark Elves raged on. But the Witch King's final invasion into Ulthuan would shatter the thousand-year status quo and force both factions to make impossible decisions as the world around them burned. Welcome to our latest episode on the end times of Warhammer Fantasy, where we will cover the fall of Ulthuan. As captivating as watching the world get destroyed is, aren't you forgetting something? Are you supposed to be running a D&D campaign? Not to fear, for our sponsor is here, it's Patero's Tome of Adventure, an over 200 page book packed with everything you need to run all kinds of D&D campaigns with minimal preparation. It covers various genres, themes and campaign lengths, with options for one-shots or short games ideal for conventions. It provides the monsters, maps, magical items, NPCs, lore, pre-gen character sheets and other handy resources all in one very adventurous tome. It's launching on Kickstarter, so give it a follow. Their stretch goals include adding even more adventures to use, and as a bonus, all backers get a free one-shot adventure PDF. So, if you're ever going to need to whip up a classic adventure in a pinch, check out Patero's Tome of Adventure, and then you can get back to watching elves murder each other in our video with a relaxed peace of mind. Link in the description. We will never forget that which has been taken from us. Ulthuan belongs to me. If it takes a thousand years, ten thousand years, I will claim my rightful place as king. I am the son of Anerion. It is my destiny. Malekith, Witch King of Nagaroth In the early history of the Warhammer world, Ulthuan and the Asur, or High Elves, were responsible for creating the Great Vortex within the Inner Sea. Since then, that vortex had faithfully siphoned the excess magic from the catastrophic failure of the Polar Gates made by the Old Ones. The Isle of Ulthuan itself was a hollow ring, protecting the Great Vortex via the ten High Elven kingdoms which encircled it. Each of these kingdoms was ruled by its own High Elf prince or princess, and each province commanded their own armies and had its own strategies to deal with both foreign and domestic threats. Proof of the continent's eternal turmoil with the Dark Elves could be found in the north and east of the continent, the coasts sunken beneath the waves. While the continent was host to eternal turmoil, it was also the home of the world's remaining dragons, which would play a shocking role in the coming invasion. With the service of this bound demon, we shall be able to move so swiftly that our enemies will not know where we are or how to stop us before it is too late. We will be able to amass our forces to overwhelm our enemies before they know what has hit them. This, more than anything else, will give us a victory. This time all of Ulthuan will be ours. This time we will succeed. This time victory is inevitable. Witch King Malekith enacting the invasion of Ulthuan Malekith's invasion into Ulthuan began from the west, led by Lokir Felhart, a dark elf corsair of noble birth. The seasoned captain of the Dark Elven fleets emerged from the mists of a dark storm and surprised the High Elven patrol vessels that guarded the seas west of Tyrannoc. Prince Morvai, returning from another battle, desperately rallied his kingdom and countered Felhard's assault with an armada of his own. Yet, as Morvai's fleets chased Felhard's squadrons away from the broken coastline, they fell into a masterfully laid trap. Thousands of High Elves were lost in the maritime skirmish, and Morvai himself succumbed to the poison of a carefully placed assassin's blade. The prince was laid to rest, and with many of Tyrannoch's warriors distracted by Lokia's retreat, the true assault began at the battle for Eagle Gate. The garrison at Eagle Gate, led by Prince Ivan, had suffered catastrophic damage during the previous Wars of Reclamation. Six of the eight walls had been breached, still unrepaired by the time the Dark Elven armies approached from the north. 
Moreover, the famed twins, Lawmaster Teclis and Prince Tyrion, could not contribute to the Redoubt's defense, for they were across the world, attempting to free Eliathra the Everchild from the terrible ritual to revive Nagash. On the other side, the Knights of Hag Grave were led by Malice Darkblade. Malus had been given the honor of leading the land invasion, for his own body hosted the slanish demon Sir Arkan, drinker of worlds. Since these dread knights had no time to prepare siege weapons, they made a reckless charge towards the six breached walls of the Eagle Gate. A rain of high elven arrows pelted the advancing army from the walls, preventing Malus's forces from erecting suitable war machines to challenge the garrisoned gate guards. Thinning the Dark Elven infantry successfully, Malus was forced to retreat north and prepare a second advance. The ruthless Dark Elven leader announced that any of his knights that dared to disobey coming orders would be executed. The next night, Malus's armies rushed the gates again, but the Dark Elves still could not make any real progress towards capturing the stronghold. The field before the Eagle Gate was bloodied with thousands of Dark Elven bodies, but the High Elves suffered minimal casualties. Enraged by the ineffectiveness of his assault, Malus was forced to call upon his reserves, the Knights of the Burning Dark, the household knights of Malus himself, who were mounted upon speeding, cold-blooded raptors. The Knights joined Darkblade's side and tried to force their way through the breached walls faster than the Eagle Gate garrison could fend them off. However, the time squandered by Malus had allowed reinforcements to arrive at the Eagle Gate. To challenge the cavalry charging the Eagle Gate, Tracian hunters and Illyrian knights rode out of the breach gates with Prince Ivan and crashed into Malus's reserve just outside of the stronghold. High above the clouds, high elven phoenixes dove down onto the dark elven infantry and began burning a path for the high elven reinforcements towards the rearguard of Malus's armies. The dark elven invasion was brought to a decisive halt. Unable to contain his rage, Malus succumbed to the Slanesh demon hosted within his blade. Exploding with renewed demonic power, the Dark Elf warrior submitted himself entirely to the whims of the demon within, slaughtering friend and foe as he carved a bloody path to Prince Ivan. The two clashed as their armies surrounded their flanks. Suddenly, the High Elven Prince was beheaded by Za'arkan's demonic claws, causing a change in the tide of battle which finally forced the High Elves to rout and retreat back to the safety of the battered stronghold. Even still, the Dark Elven rearguard was suddenly smashed into by silver chariots, heralding what was thought to be the final repulsion of the Witch King's invasion. Then, more forces arrived. The famed dragons of Kalidor blotted the blue sky above. The High Elves of Eagle Gate looked up in awe at the reinforcements summoned to their side. Their awe quickly turned to horror, however, as the beasts unleashed a carpet of dragonfire not upon the Dark Elves, but upon their own kind. Kalidor had betrayed the other nine High Elven kingdoms, and at this moment, Eagle Gate was seized by the dragons, which secured the victory of the Witch King's armies. The cycle of history repeats itself, much to the Dark God's merriment. We approach the hour of the last phoenix, when only Assyrian's fading power can save us from thirsting Cain. The fate of the Elves now relies upon two realms, one doomed to perish in fire and slaughter, and one that shall endure whilst I have strength to defend it. Mortals shall assume divine roles, the heirs of Anarion will fight the final battle, and the accursed Widowmaker shall be freed from its prison of stone. Prophecy of the End Times all of Ulthuan was shocked by the revelation of Kalidor's betrayal. As the survivors fled the Eagle Gate, the dragons perched themselves atop a nearby mountain, unable to bring themselves to slaughter their own as they escaped to the princedoms still loyal to the Phoenix King. A secret agent of Marathi, the Witch King's mother, was quietly sent to Malus during the chaos of the war, and banished the Demon of Slanesh back into Malus's blade to restore his senses. Once his mind and body were under his control again, Malus ordered his remaining soldiers to secure control of the Eagle Gate. Here the Witch King arrived to plot the second phase of his invasion into Ulthuan. Malekith, Lawmaster Teclis, and Imric, Prince of Kalidor and Lord of Dragons, 
met at the stronghold to discuss their next steps. The Lawmaster made great strides to convince Malekith that the proof of the true end times was undeniable, and that the preservation of their race lay in the affirmation that the Witch King was the true heir of Anarion the Defender, first of the Phoenix Kings. While his own twin brother plotted against Ulthwan with Malekith, Tyrion, the greatest living High Elven warrior and long-assumed heir of Anarion, returned to Ulthwan. After failing to save Eliathra from Manfred's ritual to revive Nagash, Tyrion demanded that the Phoenix King explain Kalidor's betrayal. Marching into the King's quarters, Tyrion discovered, to his horror, that the Phoenix monarch had committed suicide. The violent evidence of Finnebar's death was plastered on the walls, the bloodletter demon summoned by Malekith nowhere to be seen. Finnebar's bloodied remains were gathered at the Sea of Dreams for a funeral. The Phoenix King was buried at sea, and Tyrion was elected unanimously by the remaining faithful princedoms as Regent of Ulthuan. In his first act as Regent, Tyrion imprisoned the Caledorian princes for their betrayal of the homeland, and called for a counter-offensive against Malekith and the occupied Eagle Gate. However, the High Elven Council pleaded with Tyrion to reconsider, as the death of two rulers in the same year would certainly crush the morale of the entire isle. With neither family nor friends at his side, Tyrion continued to rally any elf still loyal to Ulthuan, and soon he slowly felt the corruption of power overcoming him. After the first month of Tyrion's regency, rumours poured in of Malekith's next move. Widowmaker, the Sword of Cain, a weapon storied to be the weapon belonging to the elven god of war, was the Witch King's next target. Seizing it would grant Malekith the murderous power of the Widowmaker, but the weapon itself was embedded in the Blighted Isle to the far north. A race between Malekith and Tyrion ensued, each rushing to the blade in an attempt to deprive the other of its ancient power. Ignoring the cries for reconsideration from his council, Teclis gathered an army for himself and made for the Blighted Isle. Malekith's armies advanced over the mountains, with Teclis emphasizing that Tyrion mustn't be allowed to seize the Widowmaker, even if it meant that the weapon would instead fall into the Witch King's hands. Simultaneously arriving at the shores of the Blighted Isle, the armies of Malekith and Tyrion collided in a bloody blitz. The two elven warriors raced to the blade, prepared to kill the other for the strength sealed within. Mad with power, and broken by the betrayal of his own brother and the Dragon Lord, Tyrion claimed the Sword of Cain and proclaimed himself the ruler of all Ulthuan. Malekith's own mother pledged support for Tyrion, and all of Ulthuan and Nagaroth split their true loyalties between the true Phoenix King and the Avatar of Cain. Warning Malekith, Teclis advised the Dark Elven King that the only hope of victory over his brother and the Dark Gods was the unraveling of the Vortex. By unbinding the Winds of Magic and sealing one within Malekith, Teclis hopes to make the King equal in power to the Gods themselves. Yet Malekith was cautious, having only just recently claimed the Phoenix Throne for himself as the rightful heir. Everqueen Ilariel denied Tyrion, refusing to be the Everqueen of a tyrant, thereby gutting his legitimate right as the new Phoenix King. In yet another gut punch to Tyrion's position, Ilariel secured the support of the Wood Elves for Malekith, just as the final hours of Ulthuan were upon them. In the chaos of political turmoil, thousands of Elves perished in the following conflicts to control the Vortex. Eventually, the unified forces of the Dark, High and Wood Elves secured victory over Tyrion's faithful. The Vortex unraveled, the Wood Elven King, Orion, was killed by Tyrion in the ensuing battle, and in the absence of the Vortex, the entire Isle of Ulthuan sank into the sea. With the Eight Winds unbound, Malekith absorbed the Wind of Ulgu to become the Incarnate of Assyrian, and Tyrion absorbed the Wind of Hish to become the Incarnate of Cain. In the Realms of Men, Karl Franz absorbed the Wind of Azir to become the Incarnate of Sigmar during the Battle for Altdorf. Malekith, the true Phoenix King, with his ever-queen Alariel and the remaining Elves, escaped the Doomed Isle through the world routes to Athel Loren, where the Eternity King reigned until the final days of the End Times. Everything I see is mine. All the other bits are mine too. I just ain't got there yet. 
when we reach the end of the whole world, we'll turn around and march back. Grimgor Ironhide, Black Orc Warboss. While the winds of magic escape the broken vortex and the sinking High Elven Island, the wind of Gur sails far to the east, binding to the green skin responsible for the biggest war the Warhammer world had ever seen. Grimgor Ironhide, renowned by his kind as the Green Slaughterer, rampaged east after his embarrassing defeat at the hands of Vardek Krom in the early invasion of Kislev. Empowered by the Wind of Gur and attracting the attention of the Great Green Prophet, the Greenskins would prove an unlikely ally against the descending armies of Chaos. More videos on the end times are on the way, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see them. Please consider liking and sharing, as it helps immensely, and don't forget to comment. We'll try to read and respond to every comment, as we want to know what you think about this video and which videos you hope to see in the future. This is the Wizards and Warriors channel, and we'll catch you on the next one.